On September 20th, the U.S. Federal Reserve made a critical announcement, one that could ripple through financial markets and impact the lives of many. The Fed chose to hold interest rates steady, but what truly caught the world's attention was their stiffer, more hawkish stance. They projected a further rate increase by year end, and their monetary policy is now set to remain significantly tighter through 2024 than previously anticipated. On the ongoing issue, Chamath Palahapataya, a prominent figure with a keen eye on financial matters, has also shared his opinion. Let's delve into his perspective and gain valuable insights into the implications of the Fed's decisions and what lies ahead. In this thought-provoking and dynamic conversation, Chamath Palahapataya and David David Sachs delve into the intricate dynamics of financial markets, economic policies, and their impact on various sectors. Their insights and observations offer a valuable perspective on the complexities of the modern economic landscape. So I think what happened this week is actually pretty important because I think the markets were really trying to force Jerome Powell to start the cutting cycle. And now they had to move the date at which they could expect cuts out by a year. And I think that we're only starting to see the reverberations of that. You're going to have to reprice a lot of risk assets. So if you put it all together, oil is creeping back up. So commodity prices essentially are trending up. I don't think that's going to have a big impact on inflation because of the way that owner equivalent rents and core CPI is calculated because it's calculated on this six month lag, this dumb nonsense of just how arcane our system works. But that's going to spike down. So basically, the Fed's like saying, we know all of this is happening, we're sitting on our hands. But the problem is that if you add another 100 basis points to your discount rate for an unprofitable SaaS company, my gosh, guys, you're taking like another turn and a half of market cap out of the business. Like if you thought it was worth eight times, it's now worth six and a half, six times. So unfortunately, that's going to hurt everything that's not the top seven tech companies. And everything else is just going to just kind of meander along for a much longer time. So it's really good for the Magnificent Seven. I think it's really bad for everything else. And we're going to be in a holding pattern for a while. The recent downturn on Wall Street serves as a stark reminder of the volatility and unpredictability that characterizes the financial markets. The primary catalyst for this decline appears to be the Federal Reserve's adherence to a restrictive monetary policy a decision that has sent shockwaves through the investment community. Investors had been hoping for a more accommodating approach from the Federal Reserve, but those hopes were dashed when Fed Chairman Jerome Powell cautioned that inflation is far from meeting the central bank's 2% target. This cautious stance has led to significant market jitters, as evidenced by the substantial 1% drop in all three major U.S. stock indexes. Furthermore, it's alarming to see that benchmark 10-year U.S. Treasury yields reached a 16-year peak, signaling that borrowing costs are escalating. This is particularly troubling for interest rate sensitive giants like Amazon, Nvidia, Apple, and Alphabet, which have significantly contributed to the S&P 500 and Nasdaq hitting their lowest levels since June. The Fed's decision to maintain the Fed Fund's target rate at 5.25% to 5.5% did little to appease the anxieties of investors. The revised economic projections, particularly the dot plot, have dashed any hopes of policy easing before 2025. This extended period of elevated interest rates will undoubtedly exert further pressure on the already fragile economy. Moreover, the laundry list of economic pressures, from student loan payments resuming, to the UAW strike, and the looming threat of a government shutdown paints a grim picture of the economic landscape. Add to this the surging treasury yields, climbing crude oil prices, and a strengthening dollar, and it becomes evident the road ahead is fraught with obstacles. The unexpected 9% drop in initial U.S. jobless claims, while initially seen as positive, only serves to reinforce the Fed's belief that the labor market is too tight which in turn puts upward pressure on wages. This only adds fuel to the fire, as it strengthens the central bank's resolve to maintain higher rates for a longer duration. Chamath Palahapataya also highlighted the crucial market response to Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell's actions. He underscores the market's expectation of rate cuts, and how the Fed's decision to postpone them by a year is causing a ripple effect. This delay compels a reevaluation of risk asset valuations, and Paula Hapataya argues that this shift in perception will particularly affect unprofitable software as a service companies. 
to Moth's concern about how the market calculates inflation is a pertinent one. The focus on core CPI and owner equivalent rents, which operate on a six month lag, might not accurately reflect the current economic landscape. This arcane system could potentially lead to misconceptions about inflation, affecting investment decisions. Jamath also highlighted the significance of rising crude oil prices and its implications for companies' financial stability. Friedberg's point about the initial predictions being off by a substantial margin underscores the volatility and unpredictability of today's markets. Jamath's revision of his previous advice to CEOs further emphasizes the fluidity of market conditions and the need for adaptability in financial planning. The uncertain timeline for rate cuts underscores the need for robust financial strategies that can withstand prolonged economic uncertainty. I told my CEOs, guys, let's get enough cash to last through the middle of 25. Sure. Remember, I was pretty clear about that to folks. I mean, get to get to default alive. But if you can't, please have enough money to the mid of 25. I think that that was wrong. I think now you got to be Q1 of 26, and maybe even mid 26. So now I have to go back to all these CEOs and redo an entire justification for why they need to cut even more people cut even more expense, cut more burn. I don't know where we're going to find another year of burn in most of these businesses. So I was wrong by at least a year, Jason, because of this. I think I got the words right, but I got the timing wrong. Startups and founders are a significant focus of this conversation, with Jamath and David Sachs shedding light on the intense pressure they face. Market expectations of rate cuts mean that startups must outperform other investment options to satisfy their investors. This puts a premium on efficiency, innovation, and customer satisfaction. David Friedberg's emphasis on doing more with less underscores the resilience and adaptability required of founders in challenging economic environments. As startups face funding challenges, they must find creative ways to extend their financial runways and make wise financial decisions. The discussion on portfolio consolidation and M&A activities highlights how companies might seek strategic partnerships to weather market turbulence. In terms of economic uncertainty, collaboration and efficiency become key key survival strategies. The markets right now are definitely taking a bath. The growth stocks are off significantly. Expect them to be off more. Yeah, and the reason is because the market had started to price in rate cuts next year. And now the Fed is saying that because inflation ticked up a little bit, it's not coming down as much, we have higher energy prices, we may not get those rate cuts. I think the, the Fed still maintains that we'll get 50 basis points of rate cuts next year. But the market was pricing in more, and I think people are starting to wonder if we'll even get the 50. So as a result of that, interest rates are going to stay higher longer, which means that risk capital will be less available. So valuations are going to go down, or at least they're not going to be racing back up like they used to. When I was saying mid-25, Sachs, that was because the forward curve started showing cuts in early 23. You know what I mean? So I was yep. like, okay, let's assume they're wrong by 18 months. It turns out that that initial data point in early 22, my God, we were wrong by three years. <laughs> so right. Not a year and a half. Right. It's brutal. And I think brutal. the X factor here is that we're running almost $2 trillion deficits in peacetime. Well, I mean, we're not in a direct war, we're in a proxy war, but in relative peacetime and in a relatively decent economy. So what happens if either of those things change? And what happens to long-term rates as all of these debt issuances have to get raised, as the Fed has to keep selling more treasuries to fund our deficit and debt at these higher rates? Do long-term rates keep going up based on the debt financing needs of the federal government? And, and this is again where, you know, we made a huge mistake by politicizing this idea of raising money beyond 30 years. We made that mistake under the Trump presidency because people reacted to Trump saying it, but it was the smartest thing we could have done to give our kids and our grandkids a reasonable economy. And Freeberg has been right all along about just like our spending is just going up and up and up. And now short-term rates are really high. Maybe we'll have enough political will to just get out of the Fed's way and the Fed can actually look at raising in durations past 30 years.
Because if you believe that we're going to start an aggressive cutting cycle at some point, and you believe we'll get back to like a 2% terminal rate, you could theoretically justify 50, 60 year bonds at, at much lower than the 30 year, but I, I don't see it happening. The discussion on consumer behavior in response to market shifts offers valuable insights into how individuals might navigate uncertain economic waters. The notion that consumers might delay significant purchases, such as car and home upgrades as interest rates rise, reflects a pragmatic approach to personal finance in a changing economic landscape. Criticism of the timing of certain union demands highlights the complex interplay between labor movements and economic stability. The conversation underscores how well-intentioned demands, such as higher wages and shorter work weeks, can inadvertently harm industries and potentially necessitate government intervention. Shifting gears, the Science Corner segment introduces an exciting breakthrough in the treatment of autoimmune diseases. Chamath's explanation of how glycosylated antigens can re-regulate the immune system offers hope for those suffering from these conditions. This innovative approach provides an alternative to traditional treatments, such as immune suppression, which can have adverse effects on overall health. The commentary on this science breakthrough demonstrates the potential for scientific advancements to transform healthcare and improve the lives of individuals grappling with autoimmune diseases. The enthusiasm in the conversation is a testament to the profound impact that in innovative medical research can have on society. In conclusion, this engaging and multifaceted discussion showcases the insights of these three experts in finance, economics, and science. It provides a comprehensive view of the challenges and opportunities in today's ever-evolving economic and healthcare landscapes. Their thoughtful commentary prompts us to consider the implications of market shifts, the resilience required of startups and founders, and the potential for scientific breakthroughs to reshape our understanding of autoimmune diseases and their treatment.